administration to roll back um, protections on our uh, from the Clean Water Act, um, the new uh, proposed WOTUS rule or Waters of the U.S. rule offers us an opportunity as a scientific community to comment on that rule. And so we thought that it might be useful to um, have a, a short webinar uh, that gives an overview of that proposed WOTUS rule, um, uh, some presentation of the science uh, that contradicts the current content of the rule and how to submit an effective uh, regulatory comment. And so I wanna give a, a little overview, an order of operations for the webinar today. Um, uh, the first thing we'll do is have a presentation by Dr. Majeka Sullivan from Ohio State University. I, I wanted to mention that this video is um, uh, via Zoom, um, but also being live stream uh, via YouTube. And so um, uh, there will be a recording of this webinar there as well. Um, and uh, after Majeka's presentation, um, uh, we'll have uh, some short comments by uh, Dr. Mike Paul, who is chair of the Society for Freshwater Sciences uh, Science and Policy Committee. And he'll give us some more information on um, how to prepare uh, effective comment letters. Those letters are due April 15th, so there's a couple of weeks out to do that, and we hope that this information will be helpful. Finally, just a bit on logistics. Um, the uh, uh, SFS, the Society for Freshwater Science, has a landing spot for uh, these documents at freshwaterscience.org slash WOTUS. So there'll be a recording of this presentation, a PDF. Majeka has been very kind to offer us the PDF of his presentation slides. Um, uh, the the uh, WOTUS comment guide that Mike Paul has prepared, uh, as well as any other resources we think uh, that might be helpful to you all uh, to provide um, uh, reference or content. Uh, for uh, letters you might prepare. And finally, uh, we're doing trying out for some uh, Zoom webinar and uh, uh, Brett Peters at uh, the Environmental Change Initiative um, at, at Notre Dame is handling this. He's in the background here. Uh, he's monitoring the chat in case there are any logistic difficulties. Um, so with that, with the housekeeping out of the way, um, I wanted to uh, thank and introduce uh, Majeka Sullivan. Uh, he's going to present uh, the proposed WOTUS rule, an overview and action steps. Um, Majeka is an associate professor and assistant director for the School of Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University. Uh, and he is um, director of the Shermeyer Olentangy River Wetland Research Park. Uh, his research uh, works on uh, water quality and aquatic ecosystems generally, uh, in integrating community and ecosystem ecology, fluid geomorphology, biogeochemistry. Um, but most relevant to today is he served as a member of the US EPA Science Advisory Board on the connectivity of streams and wetlands to downstream waters document, the, the review of that document in 2013, 2014, and has really taken on a leadership role, uh, preparing um, uh, published documents, um, uh, convening scientists around uh, the current WOTUS uh, uh, um, uh, proceedings, the, the new rule. And so we're thankful for Majeka to take um, his time uh, to present to us, and we're proud to have, have him as an SFS member. Uh, and so thanks, Majeka. I will um, stop sharing my screen and, and turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much for the introduction, Jen, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead here and boot up my screen. Um, Just give me a moment while we get these things taken care of. Great, again, thank you all for taking the time out of your schedules to join, join this webinar. Um, I think for, there we go. So my goal today 
is to provide you with a brief synopsis of reviewing some important points on the proposed waters of the US or WOTUS rule. These include connectivity of waters and why it is important, how the proposed rule differs from the 2015 and pre-2015 jurisdictions, how the new rule is inconsistent with the best available science and potential impacts of the new rule. I'll conclude by briefly overviewing some action steps that you can take. So I wanna start with an overview of the concept of connectivity and to introduce some of the key players in terms of water bodies. What you are looking at here is a conceptual figure of a watershed, also known as a catchment or drainage network. This is taken from the 2015 connectivity report in which technical experts reviewed over 1200 peer reviewed scientific publications. The larger river would be considered a traditional navigable water, in other words, jurisdictional. These will be referred to often as downstream waters during this talk. Other waters include perennial streams, those that flow year round, intermittent streams, those that flow for part of the year, often seasonally, but not always, and ephemeral streams, those that flow only after precipitation events. Floodplain wetlands are found next to rivers and lakes, whereas non-floodplain wetlands, referred occasionally to as isolated, and in the proposed rule they're referred to as isolated, are located elsewhere in a watershed. Common examples are playas, prairie potholes, vernal pools, and others. The black arrows you see here represent potential connectivity with downstream waters, in this instance, with a larger river. Under the current rule, all streams are protected, as are floodplain wetlands, with non-floodplain wetlands to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. I'll return to this figure and impacts of the proposed rule shortly. Connectivity is the notion that waters are connected to one another in various ways. And that because of these connections, streams, wetlands, and other water bodies, such as ditches and ponds, can influence downstream waters. Streams, for example, move sediment, organisms, and nutrients from upstream to downstream. And thus even headwater streams, which are smaller streams typically found higher in the watershed, affect downstream waters. The image here focuses on hydrologic pathways, movement of surface water, but this is not the only type of connectivity. Hydrologic connectivity is a type of physical connection. Other connections are also critical to consider and include, include chemical connections and biological or ecological connections. This is a key point as the intent of the original Clean Water Act was to restore and protect biological, chemical, and physical integrity of our nation's waters. I underscored the word and here, which refers to the three dimensions of water quality, not one or another. Not only can the type of connectivity vary, but connectivity can also vary over time. For instance, ephemeral streams, those that flow only after storm events, may have flow for short periods of time, but can make up large portions of stream miles in some areas of the country, such as the arid Southwest. The figure you see here is also taken from the connectivity report and illustrates the sequential transformation of materials as they move through a river network. Here, an ephemeral headwater stream exports organic matter, such as leaves that have fallen into the stream, and an intermittent headwater stream exports ammonium, which is then taken up by algae, which in turn is eaten by invertebrates, which in turn fuel fisheries throughout the watershed. Non-floodplain wetlands are also connected to downstream waters, largely through groundwater and movement of organisms, but sometimes through surface flows. As the EPA Science Advisory Board, also known as the SAB, that reviewed the connectivity report pointed out, a broad view is required to fully understand connectivity in which processes occurring across the watershed are taken into account and in which the cumulative or aggregate effects of water body connectivity are recognized. In other words, looking at individual water bodies in a watershed can lead to an underestimation of the downstream effects. For instance, the collective impacts of multiple non-floodplain wetlands or down on downstream waters is important to understand and consider. Of course, one of the most well-known examples of connectivity across broad spatial scales is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, largely attributed to nitrogen and phosphorus coming from fertilizer runoff from Midwestern fields that enters streams and makes its way into the Mississippi River and then the Gulf of Mexico hundreds of miles away. This leads to harmful algal blooms and biological deserts. This is an excellent example of how cumulative changes to streams can affect downstream water quality. Connectivity or lack thereof can thus have strong downstream effects on the biological, chemical, and physical integrity of downstream waters, such as lakes, rivers, and oceans. 
The SAB and many subsequent published findings recognize that connectivity is not a binary property. In other words, it is not connected versus not connected. Rather, the SAB recommended a connectivity gradient ranging from low to high connectivity and measured by multiple metrics, including the frequency of the connection, its predictability, duration, magnitude, timing, and rate of exchange of biota, materials, and water. This connectivity gradient reflects that the degree and downstream effects of connections are variable, and the SAB suggested using this gradient concept as a framework to help understand how changes to upstream or upslope waters can affect downstream water quality. Having briefly reviewed the concept of connectivity, I'd like to turn our attention now to the scope of the proposed rule. The revised definition of WOTUS would revise both the 2015 Clean Water Rule, also known as the CWR, and the pre-2015 definitions of WOTUS. Any revised WOTUS definition would apply to the entire Clean Water Act, not just Section 404. Section 404 of the Clean Water Act regulates the discharge of dredged or fill material into waters of the US, including wetlands. Activities in waters of the US regulated under this program include fill for development, water resource projects such as dams and levees, infrastructure development such as highways and airports, and mining projects. Section 404 requires a permit before dredged or fill material may be discharged into waters of the US unless the activity is exempt from Section 404 regulation. For example, certain farming and forestry activities. Of note, the proposed rule also does not consider or address the known net loss of wetlands national policy established by George H.W. Bush in 1989. To be clear, the proposed rule to revise the definition of WOTUS is not currently in effect. Currently, the 2015 Clean Water Rule is in effect in 22 states, DC and US territories, which are depicted by the light blue here. In 28 states, the pre-2015 regulations and guidance are in effect, which are the light green. So what are some of the key differences in the proposed rule versus the 2015 and pre-2015 jurisdictions? There are many. Firstly, the proposed rule eliminates Justice Kennedy's 2006 Rapinos significant nexus test for jurisdiction. There is no change in traditional navigable waters, in other words, they are still protected, but interstate waters are no longer an independent category and only jurisdictional if they meet conditions of another category of jurisdictional waters. There are major changes relative to tributaries. Most notable is that under the 2015 clean water rule, almost all streams are protected. Under the proposed rule, ephemeral streams lose protection. I'll discuss the lack of scientific support for this, as well as the potential impacts a little bit later. For ditches, there's an overall reduction in jurisdiction with no ditches constructed in uplands and no ditches with ephemeral flows being jurisdictional. Lakes and ponds are now in a separate category and non-navigable isolated lakes and ponds would no longer be jurisdictional. Although regulation of impoundments of jurisdictional waters would remain the same under the proposed rule, because fewer waters are jurisdictional overall, it is likely that less impoundments will be jurisdictional. One of the most significant changes is in the interpretation of the word adjacent. The proposed rule changes the definition of adjacent by excluding the significant nexus concept and the science that supports this, this notion. The agencies exclude three out of four of the dictionary definitions for adjacent, which are next to, to lie near, and close to, thereby limiting the meaning of adjacent to adjoining or abutting. Despite Justice Scalia's preference for reliance on dictionary definitions over scientific terminology. The proposed rule ignores the concept of connectivity beyond a direct hydrologic connection, thus ignoring chemical, biological, and eco ecological, and indirect hydrologic connectivity and excluding non-floodplain or geographically isolated wetlands. The proposed rule attempts to eliminate the need for case-by-case -case significant nexus tests, however, the proposed rule does not succeed in eliminating the need for case-specific analyses and acknowledge, acknowledges the need for complex professional level site evaluations to determine jurisdiction in a variety of situations. The rule does not appear to meet its own stated goals of achieving clarity, predictability, and consistency in this regard, which I discuss more a bit later. Given time limitations, I've not covered exclusions from the, uh, from the jurisdictions and differences from pre-2015 and the 2015 Clean Water Rule and the proposed rule. However, it's worthwhile reviewing these if you can find the time. 
This is the EPA graphic showing intended jurisdiction of the proposed rule. Proposed jurisdictional waters are in bold. It is notable that coastal waters are not addressed in the graphic. I'll return to a similar visual later when we discuss potential impacts. So having discussed connectivity and the scope of the proposed rule, let's turn our attention to the new proposed rule and its lack of grounding in current science. There are multiple ways in which the proposed rule is not consistent with science, and I highlight a few here. Firstly, the proposed rule relies almost solely on hydrologic connectivity in the form of flow permanence to determine jurisdiction, ignoring other types of physical connectivity as well as biological and chemical connectivity, which is, as I have previously stated, are critically important to downstream waters. As an example, consider the proposed rules definition of tributaries, which the agencies define as a river, stream, or similar naturally occurring surface water channel that contributes perennial or intermittent flow to a traditional navigable water or territorial sea in a typical year, either directly or indirectly. Firstly, the use of flow permanence from a scientific perspective is flawed, as we know that other types of flows, such as intermittent and ephemeral in particular, can have significant consequences for downstream waters. Secondly, the use of flow alone is in opposition to current science, which supports the use of multiple physical parameters that indicate connectivity, such as bed, banks, and high water marks, which serve as indisputable indicators of the connectivity of all streams to downstream waters, including all intermittent and ephemeral streams. The proposed rule also fully ignores biological and chemical connectivity. Time today does not permit a discussion of both, so I'll use biological connectivity as an example. Multiple lines of evidence point to the importance of biological connectivity between, for instance, non-floodplain wetlands and downstream waters. The SAB review noted the importance of biological connections and provided multiple literature citations to support the roles of biological taxa as mechanisms of connectivity between water bodies. Water bodies are not only important for habitat, but aquatic biota provide important functional roles, including the transport of propagules and nutrients. Aquatic organisms such as fish and aquatic insects move within and among various water body types during their life cycles. Through these movements, biota prevent inbreeding, escape stressors, locate mates, find food resources and recolonize habitats, thus contributing to biodiversity and exchanging nutrients and carbon among water bodies. In this way, they serve as critical agents of connectivity among streams, wetlands and downstream waters. This is an example of how the proposed rule fails to recognize how these ecosystems function. Without biological connectivity, ecosystem functions would be lost. In essence, the agencies propose to establish hard jurisdictional lines going against established and growing scientific evidence that connectivity and other landscape features occur along a gradient. The SAB clearly articulated the importance of recognizing gradients of water body connectivity, and this concept has been further supported in recent scientific literature regarding connectivity. It is critical to recognize that even low or infrequent connectivity can be important to downstream waters. In fact, the relative isolation of some water bodies, such as some wetlands, provide a critical function in that they trap pollutants and nutrients and prevent them from entering downstream waters. However, the proposed rule removes all non-floodplain non wetlands and ephemeral streams from protection, irrespective of their degree of connectivity and the consequences of alterations to that connectivity on downstream water quality. The proposed rule also fails to su sufficiently account for the cumulative effects of water body connectivity which was a key point, excuse me, the cumulative effects of water body connectivity, which was a key point raised by the SAB. In other words, it is critical to consider water bodies in aggregate, functional groups of streams, floodplains, floodplain wetlands, and non-floodplain wetlands in order to evaluate connectivity and understand downstream effects. As an analogy, if you break one finger in your hand, you may still be able to use it. But if you break multiple fingers or all your fingers, the functions performed by your hand are lost. Water body connectivity and water quality are complex issues that cannot be oversimplified. In order to preserve chemical, biological, and physical integrity of our nation's waters, we must understand how they function. You cannot simply protect parts of the whole, ignoring others and the critical processes necessary for watersheds to function. I've already shared with you a couple instances where functional considerations are ignored, for example, in not accounting for how water bodies, water bodies function collectively. The proposed rule also does not adequately view water bodies as part of their broader watersheds and landscapes. A key recommendation of the SAB was to view water bodies as part of larger systems by adopting watershed 
riverscape, riverine landscape, and groundwater basin perspectives to understand connectivity. The proposed rule relies overly on case law rather than a solid understanding of water body connectivity and the complexity of drainage networks, landscapes, and watershed processes. Further, just, further justification for the proposed rule draws on findings and recommendations from the connectivity report and the SAB review. Yet some interpretations of these findings are misleading and taken out of the appropriate context. This leads to unsupported recommendations of the proposed rule to remove protections for critical components of watersheds, such as ephemeral streams that can have important downstream effects. An excellent example of how their proposed rule ignores how watersheds function is the disregard for groundwater connectivity. It is well established that the interactions between surface and groundwater make them a single resource. Over short spatiotemporal scales, distinguishing, distinguishing between surface water and groundwater is inappropriate, with wetlands and streams linked by integrated surface water and groundwater flow systems, modulating both the local storage of water and the rate at which water flows to downstream waters. Indeed, given the close connection between surface and groundwater, scientists created the term hyperreic zone, which refers to the boundary where river water and groundwater freely mix under and around the river channel. To disregard groundwater connectivity, especially over small distances and short time span, is to disregard the reality of how natural waters function. The fact that the proposed, the newly proposed rule includes the following language, quote unquote, the proposed definition specifically clarifies that waters of the United States do not include features that flow only in response to precipitation, groundwater, including groundwater drains through subsurface drainage systems, end quote shows a significant lack of understanding where and how natural waters accumulate on a landscape. Virtually every water is fundamentally dependent on rates of precipitation, accumulation on the surface, and infiltration into the ground. Those accumulated flows are absolutely essential for formations of various types of our nation's waters. In addition to the scientific flaws and highly concerning loss of protections, the proposed WOTUS rule is not clear. Although the agencies state that the proposed WOTUS rule would establish jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act in a clearer and more understandable way, the rule is inconsistent and sets dangerous precedents in fundamental areas. For example, the agencies also propose to remove case-by-case -case evaluations for non-floodplain wetlands, yet propose case-by-case -case judgments or their equivalent in multiple other instances. For example, if the agencies are unsure whether a ditch was constructed in a tributary, in which case it would be considered a WOTUS under the proposed rule, the agencies would then review the available evidence to determine when the ditch was constructed and the nature of the landscape before and after construction. Thus, the proposed rule selectively applies case-by-case -case considerations to water bodies for which such examination is likely to result in exclusion from Clean Water Act protections and remove such consideration from water bodies such as non-floodplain wetlands where a case-by-case -case examination is more likely to afford protection. The agencies are also unclear about the precise way jurisdictional, in other words, perennial and intermittent, streams will be evaluated. The agencies suggest using a combination of methods to distinguish perennial and intermittent from ephemeral streams, including field visits and remote tools. One proposal is to require a minimum annual flow duration, such as at least one month per calendar year, which would then exclude vast numbers of intermittent streams that are critical habitat for fish spawning and rearing, among other functions. The agencies also suggest using blue line streams on US Geological Survey, topographic or national hydrology data set NHD maps to identify a potential jurisdiction, jurisdictional stream. While the agencies indicate that combining this information with other measure, measures such as stream order or field work will be important to avoid overestimating flow and erroneously concluding the presence of a jurisdictional tributary, the opposite problem is most likely. That drainage networks have not been mapped at sufficient resolution and thus could grossly underestimate streams on the landscape. NHD maps representing the best avail available spatial stream data for the US have been shown to capture only 66% of stream length compared to maps based on high resolution LIDAR data. Other advanced tools include a model developed by the USGS of stream flow permanence for the Pacific Northwest at a 30 meter resolution. The probability of stream flow permanence or PROSPER model could be a substantial improvement over current NHD derived maps, including predicting intermittent ephemeral streams and ephemeral streams, excuse me. In contrast, using blue line streams would fail to account for substantial portions of streams across the US landscape. The agencies also seek public comments on numerous issues that could further weaken protections. 
Lastly, the proposed rule is not defensible. The 2015 Clean Water Rule is supported by EPA's 2015 Connectivity Report, finding from the EPA's Science Advisory Board, and by recent literature, significant body of recent literature, in fact. All of these document the state of the science in support of the 2015 Clean Water Rule. The agencies do not provide any comparable body of peer-reviewed science to support the proposed rule. So let's recap the likely impacts. To briefly illustrate, I'll take you back to this image I shared with you earlier. Now let's remove protection from all ephemeral streams and the important con contributions they make to downstream waters. Let's now remove protections for all not floodplain, wetlands, and their contributions. Let's also remove protections for some intermittent streams, as this might be an outcome given the nature of comments requested by the agencies. Then multiply these losses across watersheds in the US. In addition to these impacts, the proposed rule also seems to leave open the possibility that human activities can actually lead to removing waters from protection. Under current human use and water management schemes, highly vulnerable intermittent and ephemeral streams and rivers are increasingly replacing perennial streams in some parts of the country. For example, a recent study documented a loss of 558 kilometers or 21% of stream length from 1950 to 1980 in the upper Kansas River Basin, presumably as a result of groundwater pumping accentuated, accentuated by climate change, with a cumulative loss of 844 kilometers or 32% predicted by 2060. Thus, as perennial streams shift to ephemeral, they will lose protection under the proposed rule, setting a dangerous precedent for future loss of federal protection. Under future climate change scenarios, certain wetlands may also become non-permanent, but no less critical for mitigating extreme rain events. Jurisdictional ditches must also continue to meet the definition of a tributary, even after human alterations under the proposed rule. The potential consequences of this proposed rule are dire, and they really cannot be understated. The proposed rule would lead to a loss of protection for some of our nation's most vulnerable waters. Headwater streams comprise 79% of our nation's stream networks. Wetlands outside of floodplains comprise 6.59 million hectares in the conterminous US, which is roughly, I believe, the size of the state of Maine. Bear in mind the backdrop on which this could play out. Over 70% of stream and river length in the conterminous US are already currently impaired. Wetland loss, including but not limited to wetlands outside of floodplains across the US is staggering, with some Midwestern states such as Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Missouri, having lost 85% of wetland area since the 1780s. Under the proposed rule, we will lose many ecological functions of our watersheds provided by headwaters, such as the delivery of water, sediments, and organic material to downstream waters, contributions to nutrient cycling and water quality, flood protection and mitigation, and habitat and food resources for fish and other aquatic and riparian organisms, such as bears and birds. These important functions of headwater streams maintain biodiversity in fisheries, not only within headwater regions, but also in downstream rivers, lakes, and coastal areas. In particular, habitat for many endemic and threatened fish species, as well as species supporting economically important fisheries will be lost. It is also important to note that these waters are culturally important for many segments of US society, with particularly high significance for many native US peoples, a consideration which is often overlooked. As discussed earlier, the proposed rule seems to leave the door open for human activities to lead to future loss of protections. To conclude, impairment or loss of chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters, in other words, loss of water quality, is assured under the proposed rule and would have severe and long-lasting negative consequences for environmental conditions throughout the US. I'd like to close by discussing a few action steps that you or your group can take. I'll start with a comment letter, which can serve as clear opposition to the US EPA and Army Corps concerning the proposed rule. Comment letters can also be used later in the process, as this is likely to play out for quite some time by providing useful information to groups and agencies opposing the rule down the road. We urge you to submit comments. Relative to the specifics of the comment letter, you can submit them either individually or as part of a group. As a reminder, the deadline for submitting comments is April 15th, the link is provided here. Comments on the proposal should be identified by the docket ID, also provided here, may be submitted online. For more information, go to www.regulations.gov and follow the online instructions for submitting comments to the above ID, uh, docket ID number. 
Please consider the following information as you prepare comment letters. Don't forget to include the docket number. For the introduction, state your expertise if you are writing the letter alone or include information about your group if you are writing a joint letter. Make sure you clearly state your position on the proposed rule. For the body of the letter, I've listed a number of suggestions including providing information and examples of what the proposed rule would mean for water resources in your state or region. Keep in mind that you don't need to comment on every issue. Also, the letter will be stronger if it avoids inflammatory rhetoric or related comments. We respond to specific comments posed in the proposed rule where the agencies are requesting feedback and conclude by restating your position and urging the agencies to amend the rule accordingly. Lastly, spread the word by encouraging others to submit comment letters. Use social media and other modern communication channels to get the word out and seek coverage from traditional media in your area. Please remember that this is an ongoing process that won't end with the April 15th deadline to submit comments to the Federal Register. After that date, consider calling or writing letters or joining group letters to your representatives and senators uh, that urge opposition to this proposed rule. I hope that this overview was helpful uh, and provided you with some useful information relative to the, to the proposed rule. Uh, we will be following up and posting resources as I believe Jen will talk about in a few minutes uh, to the SFS website including this presentation, um, official comments from the members of the former SAB board, uh, and, and a couple new publications relative to the issue. Um, I believe there will also be an instructions letter for SFS members from the SFS Science and, and Policy Committee, uh, which Mike Powell will spoke, speak about in a few minutes. Um, and these resources will be posted as they become available. Thank you very much for your time. And at this point, I'm going to take a few seconds to uh, hand it back over to, to Jen. Majeka, thank you so much for um, that overview. It's tremendous. Uh, and I think is really going to be an amazing resource for folks, especially with uh, some of the deep dive details that you've given, as well as some of the documents we'll post that you've led uh, recently around this. So thank you so much for that. Um, I uh, am going to turn it over now to Mike Paul. He is chair of the Science and Policy Committee for SFS, and he has prepared a short guide for uh, preparing comments and also has uh, some additional uh, information that he'd like to share. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen for a slide and, um, and then let, turn it over, uh, turn it over to, to Mike. Let me do that. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you guys yeah. hear me? Okay, great. Great, thanks Jen and thanks Majeka for that amazing uh, presentation. Uh, this will be a real valuable resource uh, for members uh, in preparing their letters. Um, and so in, to support letter writing by the members of SFS, um, I should mention the, the society will be preparing a comment letter as we have prepared comment letters on all phases of uh, this rulemaking process since 2014. And so we will continue that this proposed rulemaking um, and any supplementary notices or anything else that comes out during the process. Um, but we really encourage members uh, to write your own letters. Um, it's very valuable uh, to get a variety of, uh, of opinions and uh, as broad and deep a set of uh, arguments as we possibly can. And so to support that effort for you guys, um, we've prepared a, a comment letter overview. Um, it builds off a lot of what Majek has uh, presented as well. Um, there's um, it's split into sort of three parts. There's a, a background and purpose for the document. There's an overview of the proposed changes along with some implications and recommendations based on um, our read, of the, the Science and Policy Committee's read of the proposed rule. Um, there's a section on instructions for submitting comment letters that is very much like what Majeka presented, but um, it, you'll have it in the guide as well. There's links there for getting to the rule, for getting to the regulations.gov site for where you actually submit a comment um, and some do's and don'ts that, that will be very similar to what was just presented. Um, at the end of the guide, there's also a sort of history of the Waters of the U.S. rulemaking process. For those of you who are interested, um, either for your own personal edification or for maybe uh, working with students in classrooms, as you discuss this important uh, rulemaking issue with them, um, it's certainly the, uh, if you'll forgive the pun, the watershed um, a legal moment of our time. So um, it may be important to share that information with them in some of your classes. So there's that is at the end of the guide as well. Um, and that will all be made available on the SFS website, um, on the VOTUS site that um, 
that uh, Ryan and the folks at the, uh, the web group at SFS have put together, which is you can see right on the front of the SFS webpage. Um, just to double on, on something that or to, to restate something that Majeka said again, we really encourage you all to, to, to write personal letters if you have the time to do it. Uh, we've tried to provide and boil down issues to make it easy for you to write. Um, like Majeka said, don't, you don't need to comment on anything. I mean, it's a 70 page rule, triple columned rule. You don't have to cover everything. Um, we've covered some of the major issues, um, but even within those, you know, stay in, an, in, a, in your comfort zone. If there's particular issues you feel really strongly about or have expertise in, um, certainly hit those, those issues hard, uh, hard, but anything you can do would be a, a real benefit. So we hope that uh, as many members as possible will take the opportunity um, to write a letter and we've tried to provide as many resources to help you do that as we can. So um, thanks for the time, Jen, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Okay, thanks so much, Mike. We really appreciate the work that your committee has done and, and your leadership on this. This is going to be a great resource for SFF, SFS members and others. Uh, so just a reminder that, um, uh, let me see if I can make this go forward. There we go. Just a reminder that the, the comments to the rule are due on April 15th, so that's two weeks from now. Uh, consider writing and providing a comment, telling your story, picking your piece of your expertise, that would be great. And then uh, as Majeka mentioned, it, it really doesn't end on April 15th. Um, there'll be opportunities to share your views, uh, especially with your uh, uh, legislators um, at, at some point after that. Um, so we wanna just emphasize that it will provide us many resources as possible, including the recording of this webinar on the freshwaterscience.org slash WOTUS resource page. You can see the address, uh, the, the link there. Um, uh, the comment guide will be there and some other recent uh, publications and, um, and, and documents that, that summarize the impact of, of this proposed rule change. Um, and with that, uh, we made it through with any technical difficulties from New Zealand and Ohio and <laughs> North Carolina and Indiana. So we're really um, pleased with that. And thanks to all of you out there for joining. And uh, with that, we'll sign off. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.